I want to tell you a story, and um, I had read it a long time ago, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit started to prompt me um, about it. Chris, stay with me for a few minutes until we pray. Don't we appreciate Chris and the worship team and everyone that works in this house? Man, amazing. So the story is about this old fisherman, and he was a professional. As a matter of fact, he caught more fish than any other fisherman on the pier. But strangely enough, every time he caught a fish, he would take out his measuring tape and he would measure the fish. Every fish that was small, he kept. And every fish that was large, he ended up throwing back in the ocean. So the onlooker said to him, What's going on? Why do you keep the small fish and throw back the fish, the big fish? He said, because my frying pan <laughs> is only eight inches wide. He never thought that he could buy a bigger frying pan, therefore keep the bigger fish. I thought to myself, oftentimes, we're just like that fisherman. We have a limited view of God's goodness. We try to fit all his grace, kindness, mercy, and love in an eight-inch mindset. We take out our spiritual measuring tape and see if we measure up. We see if his goodness fits our religious mindset because we're religious pros. But God's love and grace and mercy and kindness, it cannot be measured. The Bible tells us it is uh, immeasurable. It is incomprehensible. We will never be able to understand it. And you know what? His grace, mercy, kindness, and love, it works even when we're distant from him. Even when we fail him. And even when we're lost in the house, let's pray. Father, I thank you because you are nothing like we think you are. Every time I read your response in the Bible, I'm so surprised because it's never my response. Oh, but today, God, we want to believe that you're the God that not only seeks and saves the lost outside, but you seek and save the lost inside the house because you love us. So God, today, do something deep in our hearts with this simple word, God. Set us free, we pray, that our mindset would grow bigger and bigger as we bask in your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, I, I usually say this, that I am not a Bible teacher. I say I'm the woman with the issues, right? I'm not the woman with the issue because I have so many issues. I have so many sermons. And usually I get a sermon out of an experience that I've encountered. So uh, a number of weeks ago, a woman texted me during the service and she said, Pastor Maria, would you be able to pray with me afterwards? And I said, absolutely. I know this woman. I don't know her really well. She's a young woman. But what I do know is that she has a lot of health problems. So after the service, we connect and um, I start to pray for her. She starts to tell me about what she's going through. And she says, you know, night after night, I end up in the emergency room. I'm in excruciating pain. And um, the doctors are telling me I have this sort of thing and that sort of thing. And it's not good. So I said, absolutely, we're going to pray. I get out the anointing oil and I start to pray for her. And all of a sudden, she starts to weep. And she starts to confess and she starts to apologize. And she said, you know, Pastor Maria, I know God is doing this to me. I know he's punishing me. 
She said, I tried to get involved in a ministry. She did not name the ministry. She said, and I was very, very offended. I guess she was overlooked somehow. And she says, you haven't seen me around for months. She says, because I left the church. She says, not only did I leave the church, but I've been gossiping and I've been bad mouthing the church. I've been bad mouthing the leadership. And now look at me, look at the condition I'm in. My heart broke for her. I threw myself on her and I said, no, this is not the Lord. God does not punish us. I said, he may discipline us gently. He disciples us. He convicts us, but he does not punish us. He does not inflict disease. That's just not God. I talked about this situation. I didn't mention the woman's name to two different old fishermen. The old pros in the house of God. And their response to me was, well, maybe God, I said, no. No, that mindset has to be broken. No, absolutely not. That is not the God we serve. This is someone, she grew up in church. I said to her, you know, if God punished us, we'd all be paralyzed. Some of us would be in a coma. If God exposed every thought we ever had or every attitude we've had or every time we've opened our mouth and gossiped, of course, covering it, you know, let's pray for I just want to set the record straight because some of you got baptized today and you're new believers. But for believers in Christ, all our sin, all our sin, past, present, and future has already been nailed to the cross. It's already been judged by the cross. The harshness we deserve, Jesus took that, that debt on Calvary. It's done once and for all. That's why it's called good news. It's called good news. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. The apostle Paul, the great apostle Paul, he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I don't know what Paul was doing. He says, but I end up doing. He said, oh, wretched and weary, oh, tired. I'm trying my best. But he says, but thanks be to God for those who are in Christ Jesus that are in the sea of forgetfulness that are covered by the blood. There is therefore now, now no condemnation. There is no condemnation. She had an eight inch understanding of who Jesus really is. And I fear that many times that's our understanding. But Jesus' kindness and grace and love and mercy cannot be contained in an eight inch frying pan. In the book of Hebrews 12:2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In the NIV, it says, fix, fixate your eyes on Jesus. Now, we could take that two ways. Of course, in every and any situation, we want to look unto Jesus because he's the beginning, he's the end, and he's everything in between. But I also want us to fix our eyes, not on religion, I want us to fix our eyes on Jesus and his response in any and every situation. I want us to look at Jesus' response when we get lost in the house. Anybody ever got lost in the house of God? We know that he came to seek and save the lost. We celebrated 
people that have just given their life to Christ. We rejoice. But what about when we get lost in the house of God, when we get sidetracked, when life happens, when we get disappointed, when we get offended, when we are wobbling in our faith, when we start to doubt, do we believe that he still cares for us in the house? Or do we think he only cares about what we do in the house? Or do we think he cares about where we serve in the house? Or do we think he cares about how much we give to the house? So I want to read three different parables that I felt the Holy Spirit led me to in response to this woman's situation about how Jesus came to rescue those in the house. He's not only seeking the lost outside the house, he's seeking the lost inside the house. And we would be a liar to say that we in the house have never felt a sort of way that we've never been offended, that we've never been discouraged, we've never been disappointed, we've never been traumatized, we've never had a bad experience, we've never felt cold. So the Holy Spirit started to speak to me, and in Luke 15, there's these three parables, and it's called the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Now, when I went to commentators, they all said that it was about uh, unbelievers becoming believers. But the more I read the language, the more I read the parables in different translations, I finally found one commentator that agreed with me that these parables are not those outside lost, they're lost on the inside. And it also shows us the great lengths that Jesus went to to rescue them. So I'm gonna start with parable number one, the lost sheep, and I'm gonna read Luke 15 verses three to six. And it says this, so Jesus shares this story if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go for a search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he found it, he will joyfully carry it home carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. The lost sheep or the lost lamb already belonged to the shepherd. He was already part of the sheep fold. He already had a home in the sheep pen. He was fenced in. He was loved and, 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 and felt safe and, and he was fed. He had boundaries of protection. But this sheep started to nibble, taking small bites, a little morsel, a bite at a time, until this protective fence had a hole in it. It ended up wandering onto dangerous territory. It probably felt confused. There were wolves and prey ready to attack the sheep. So does the shepherd say, ha, no worries, I have 99 others. I have plenty of worship leaders and plenty of children's ministry and host and band. Does he say, ha, I did everything for him. I protected him. I fenced him in. <laughs> He's on his own. As a matter of fact, good riddance, bye-bye. 
he was an annoying little sheep anyway. <laughs> he was always bothering the other sheep. So better that he's gone. No, no. The shepherd goes out and he searches. He goes into dangerous territory. Territory he would never, ever have gone had it not been for the lost sheep. And he searches high and low until he finds the sheep. And the sheep must have been injured. It must have been wounded. It must have been thirsty. It must have been hungry. Because the Bible tells us that he picks up that sheep and he puts it on his shoulders. He carries this 70 pound dead weight on his shoulders. He could have made him crawl back, but he carries him back. He could have punished, but he carried. Parable number two, the lost coin. Luke 15, eight and nine, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. This lost coin, he was, it was already in the house. The coin was valuable. The coin had purpose. The owner had a plan for the coin. The owner worked hard to have this coin in its possession, just like Jesus worked hard to get us into his possession. This coin was a day's wages. Calvary was a day's wages. All the sin of mankind was forgiven so that the, the, the owner of the coin can have value in his house. But somehow this valuable coin got lost got lost in the house. It somehow got dropped. It ended up in a dark corner in a dusty place, isolated. The other people in the house neglected to try to find the coin because the other people in the house probably didn't even realize that the coin was missing. See, they, the nine, they were all together. You know, they were a little click. They knew one another. They didn't realize that the one coin was dropped. Maybe someone forgot to call you back. Sorry. Maybe someone forgot to include you, forgot to invite you, made you feel unseen. Maybe handled you in the wrong way. And you're not as shiny as when you first came in the house. You're not as enthusiastic as you were when you first came in the house. Now you feel dusty and smudged. But you see, even though it was lost, it never lost its value. It was as valuable in the dust as it was when it was in the hand of the owner. So what does the owner do? The owner lights a lamp. In those days, the houses were dark. He, she lights a lamp and she takes a broom and she starts to sweep the entire house, the Bible says. All the dust is kind of, you know, rising up until she finds this coin. You see, the owner is lighting a light today on your situation. He knows how you feel. He knows you may have been dropped. He knows you may be hurt, but he's sweeping away to say, look, I see you. I see you. It matters that you are not in the house. You know, on every coin, there's an imprint of the government it belongs to. Well, we belong to the government of heaven. 
and God's imprint has been stamped on us. We are sealed, we are marked, we are His, and our owner will not rest until He finds us because we matter to Him. You have a purpose and a plan. Allow Him to hold you and heal you. Parable number three, the lost son. But I'm going to call it the lost sons, and I'm going to ask Chris, thank you if you can help me. In Luke 15, 11, Jesus says, to illustrate this point further, Jesus tells them a story about a man who had two sons. To illustrate what point? To illustrate the point that every single one of these examples were lost in the house. We're going to call this the parable of the lost sons. Because there were two sons in the house. Both grew up in the house. They were sons of the house. Both had the same merciful, kind, gracious father. But both had an eight-inch mindset. I'm going to read the elder brother first. Luke 15, 25 to 32. It says, meanwhile, now this is after his brother comes home and is getting a party. And this is so typical of being lost in the house. Many times we can identify with the elder brother. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the fields working. <laughs> the other brother's getting a party. He's in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and, and dancing in the house. And he asked one of his servants, what was going on? And the servant says, your brother is back. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Yay. Yay. So happy for him. Mm. Yep, so happy. The older brother was angry, angry, and wouldn't go in. His father, his father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And all that time you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours, not this brother of mine, Division in the house. This is what the devil does. The son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes. You celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father came to him, so his father leaves the party. The father leaves the party because this son was just as important as the son that was being celebrated. His father said to him, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother, your brother, where a family was dead and now has come back to life, he was lost. Now he's found. This son never left the house. Yet he is as lost. He's as lost as the brother that left. What do you mean he's as lost? He's working. His brother, sleeping with prostitutes, squandering all that money. What do you mean he's just as lost? He is just as lost as the distance of the brother that left far away to a distant land 
This guy in the house is as distant to the proximity of his father as his brother was. He has no relationship with his father. He's dutiful. He has this performance-based mentality. He's not serving out of love. He's serving out of duty. He's serving out of, do you love me now, daddy? Do you see me now, daddy? He thinks he has to earn his father's love. And because he's in this earning, measuring, this is what he did for them, and this is what he did for, well, what did he do for me? He's calculating. He's criticizing. What an insult to the Father, full of grace and mercy and kindness and love, to think that the Father ever made him earn his keep. He's a son. You see, good sons, he was a good son. Good sons think they have to carry the load. God's sons cast their cares upon him because he cares for them. They know to throw back into the ocean that burden and that, that care because he cares. But, so, but good sons, they, they carry, they grit their teeth. They bite the bullet. They come and serve even when they don't want to. He's tired and wounded. He's bruised. He's bitter. I bet he wasn't all that pleasant to be around. And now the party, it's a punch in the gut. His sense of fairness is being challenged. We've been there. Like when we're faithful but they get engaged. They get married. They get the raise. They're honored. Does anyone see me? What about me? What about me? But his father leaves the party because he sees the condition of this lost son. He's broken over this lost son. And he, what does he say? He says, dear son, my precious son, my precious daughter, you didn't have to earn your keep in the house. I'm your father. Everything I have is yours. You're mine. I do anything for you. And let me say this on a side note, because I know we don't ever want to take advantage of God's grace. We don't want to overdo it. You know what I think upsets God when we think too little of him? I don't think it upsets God that we ask him too much. I think it upsets God when we take out our little measuring tape and we try to put his grace in our eight inch frying pan to see, do we deserve it? Would God give this to me? He says, dear son, I love you. I read this scripture last night. It's not in the notes, but listen to this from the message. It's Psalm 145 verses eight and nine. It says, God is all mercy and grace. <laughs> I mean, that's who he is. He's all comfort. He's all love. This isn't just an attribute of him. This is who he is. God is all mercy and grace. Not quick to anger. Is rich in love. God is good to one and all. Everything he does is soaked through grace. 
going to talk about the younger son. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time. But for those of you that have been in the house, you know the story. <laughs> this son, he's young and he's entitled and he asks for his inheritance before time. And he goes to a distant land. He wants to get as far away from the father's house as he can. And he wants to be where the action is because he thinks that the grass is greener out there. He's just bored in the house. So the father complies and gives him the inheritance and he squanders all his money on reckless living and prostitutes. And he's broke and he's busted. And then when it rains, it pours. Now there's a famine. And he ends up feeding pigs and the Bible tells us, but they wouldn't even give him any of the pig's food. So he remembers his father's house. He remembers, wow, it wasn't all that bad, was it? A little boring, but it was boring because he didn't really know the father. Oh, when you know the father, it's not boring. I'll go back, not as a son. I'll go back as a servant. Sounds nice. But I want us to look at the father's reaction. And whether you've run away in a distant land, whether you're sleeping with prostitutes, there's mercy for you. Whether you're in the house and you're far from your father and you're doing all the right things, you're a good son. The Bible says that while he was a long way off, we could be a long way off in the house, the father recognizes him. Maybe you've been out there and you're dirty, or maybe you've been in here and you're kind of contorted, no longer smiling. While he was a long way off, his father recognizes him. See, no one else may recognize you. But your father knows you. He knows who you are, really. He knows the plans he has for you. And the Bible says his father ran. And we know the story that the father should never run. It's undignified. But why do you think the father ran? I thought about this long and hard. You know why I think he ran? I think he ran to get to his son before anyone else could get to him. I think he ran to his son before someone else could say something negative to him. before someone else could criticize him and shame him. He ran to protect him, to stand in front of him. Was the father hurt by the son? Absolutely, yes. But you see, God's love for us is greater than his hurt. Because mercy always triumphs over judgment. He told his servants, I love this. He told those that are in the house that had the father's heart. He told them, quick, get a robe, cover his stench before that smell of the pig pen comes out quick quick get sandals cover the dirty feet quick quick get a ring master pass it <laughs> let them know belongs to me he's validated he picks his servants I want us to be his servants servants that wouldn't delight in the son's recklessness, in the son's condition. 
but servants that would delight in the mercy of the Father. You see, he saves to the uttermost. And you have, might have gotten lost. Maybe the singers can help me in the house for whatever reason. <laughs> We've all been there. You have maybe have taken your eyes off him, but he hasn't taken his eyes off you. You may have written yourself off, but I promise you, he will never write you off. So today, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put away your measuring tape. I want you to put away your measuring tape because you can't measure how much you're loved by God. You can't measure how much he cares about you. You can't measure it. And listen, if you are here and you are resisting, that means you have the measuring tape and you're saying, well, he didn't. Well, he didn't. Faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Put your measuring tape down. Put it down and let his grace overwhelm you. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that could pardon and cleanse within. It's an old song. Grace, grace, God, great. God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin and all our doubt. Fix your eyes on Jesus, not on religion. Religion is measured. His grace, that's right for you, for you and for you. It's without measure for you, for you, for you. Notice, in every instance, he never condemned. He never scolded. He never pointed a finger. He never had a disgusted look. He's our defender. He's not our accuser. He's the lifter of our heads. He doesn't kick us when we're down. I don't know about you, but I want to be that kind of servant to others and I want to be that son or daughter to God I, I read this scripture this morning I don't think I ever saw it before it's in Exodus 34 and it's when God was giving Moses the law so Moses is coming with the two stone tablets and you know that the stone tablets they they signify our heart our hearts like stone and that's why when Moses came down from the mountain and the people were sinning immediately he threw the stone tablets down because the law could never be obeyed it didn't even last one moment <laughs> apart from God's grace we can't obey the law the law is the measuring tape so as Moses is bringing down the stone tablets, this is what it says. It says, God passed in front of him <clears throat> and proclaimed. <clears throat> now this is the Old Testament, because I know maybe somebody here, some religious scholar, some theologian is thinking that I am preaching sloppy agape and I'm not because it's his kindness that leads us to repentance, period, period. It says, if you love me, you'll obey me. We don't have an obedience problem. We have a love problem. We have a love problem because we have a measuring tape. God proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving rebellion and sin. Look what it says in Ephesians. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power 
that comes from God. How many want to celebrate today? They're going to sing this, this song and we're going to worship the Lord. We're not gonna feel bad about being lost. We're gonna feel great that God is looking for us today and He loves us beyond measure.